Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or for wherever you're joining us. My name is Andy Blancher, and I lead our Emerging Issues he team here at ISO. But enough about me. Uh, I wanted to be able to jump right into a webinar. We are really excited to have everyone here. Uh, first, though, I will start with our antitrust statement, as we always do. The policy of Verisk Analytics and subsidiary companies is to comply in all respects with federal and state antitrust laws. With this in mind, we want to mention that during all seminars he held in our auspices, this policy prohibits discussion of certain topics. Because we want to avoid even the appearance of an antitrust violation, we go beyond the letter of the law and we will not discuss any matter that violates the spirit of the antitrust laws or could be perceived as doing so. A copy of our policy statement on discussions at meetings can be found at veris.com slash statement. Our topic today, Modern Cannabis 2021 and beyond. And I have to tell you, uh, even though our ISO Emerging Team, Emerging Issues Team tracks over 40 topics, it's really a challenge to stay atop cannabis. It seems like every day there's a new state legalizing cannabis, there's a new cannabinoid being discovered or synthesized, uh, a new celebrity starting a cannabis company. And sometimes I wish we almost could devote a person, a full-time person, on studying this fascinating topic. But fortunately, we do have our guest today, and he does just that. So we're really excited to have Sean Arnold with us. He is a uh, founder of a cannabis consulting firm, Teradyn Consulting, and he's going to share his unique insights and some of the latest developments in the cannabis industry. And he's going to get into both potential risk exposures and also new opportunities, because I think a lot of times when we think about cannabis, we you know kind of immediately think about all the risks, and certainly they are prevalent, but clearly there's opportunities as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Sean. Sean, it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you all who are listening. I'm excited to share my insights on the industry with you. A little background on myself. Uh, as Andy had mentioned, I'm co-founder of Teradyme Consulting. I personally got started in the cannabis industry in 2014. I had uh, what I consider to be one of the um, most incredible job opportunities being handed the keys to an empty 10,000 square foot warehouse with four licenses, uh, two medical and two recreational to uh, bring forth a vision for an edibles company uh, in the Colorado market. And um, with a lot of determination uh, and in a solid team surrounding me, we did exactly that. Over time, we built that into a multi-state operation, had operations in Nevada, Pennsylvania. We won licenses in Ohio and Missouri. And uh, in time, the ownership team came together and decided to um, sell. And we found a larger MSO to uh, sell most of our assets to. And at that time, a couple of my colleagues and I got together and thought we have a lot of experience and knowledge. So why don't we form a consulting team and bring that that experience to the table and help others find their own success which is where we uh, founded Teradyme Consulting and, and as Andy had mentioned we're a comprehensive cannabis consulting team and we focus primarily on um, quality management principles and continual improvement within the industry so um, once again just happy to be here and happy to share some insights so uh, with that we'll jump into and uh, talk about uh, where the, the cannabis industry is today and uh, the opportunities at hand. So we have to tip our hat to, uh, to California for kicking us off back in the mid-90s and legalizing medical cannabis. Over the next two and a half decades, we've seen 70% of the U.S. follow suit. We currently have 36 states with medical cannabis programs, and that's serving just under 4 million registered patients. Last year, the medical um, side of the industry saw around $9 billion in sales, and that comprised about 45% of the total market share. That's expected to grow over the next five years to exceed $15 billion, and market share will actually drop uh, down to 35% from 45%, and that's because, obviously, the growth on the recreational side 
uh, is, is going to outpace the, the medical growth. In 2012, uh, we have Colorado and Washington to thank for legalizing recreational cannabis. And as uh, many of you know, over the last nine years, we've seen 16 other states doing the same. So we now have approximately 43% of the adult population, 108 million um, citizens with access to legal cannabis. And that's pretty impressive. There's about 41 million uh, actual cannabis consumers within that population. Last year, uh, recreational sales around $11.2 uh, billion in sales. That was 55% of the market share. And that's expected to grow uh, north of 27 billion by 2025. And, and it'll encompass about 65% of the market share. Now, we all experienced a turbulent year last year with the pandemic, but it was pretty impressive to see how the cannabis industry responded. 70% increase in sales in 2020 alone. So um, really kind of eye-catching numbers there. We're seeing this spread out amongst various business models. There's about uh, 7,500 dispensaries across the states. We see approximately 12,000 growers, 4,000 processors, manufacturers, and 300 testing labs serving the industry. All in all, it's about 320,000 full-time jobs currently. We expect to see that number rise, obviously, as more states come online and, and more businesses are awarded licenses. We're also seeing public approval at an all-time high. Uh, recent Gallup polls show that that's hovering around 68% up from low 60s over the last decade. So uh, we're seeing uh, a wider acceptance uh, among the general population. We're also seeing a shift in the dynamics um, uh, of the consumer base. And so uh, over the past three years, we've seen about a 10% increase in the female consumer base. And it's now about a 50-50 split between female and male consumers. Generationally, millennials are leading the charge. 26% of the market are millennials, followed by Generation X, and then baby boomers following suit. In terms of products that we're seeing uh, in popularity, flower is king of the hill, has been king of the hill, and will probably king of the hill for the foreseeable future, uh, following closely behind our vapes. And then edibles are, are gaining some traction. Um, we're seeing a new category within edibles being beverages. The beverages saw the largest increase over the last year with a 70% increase. Uh, still a fairly small market share, but anticipate that really growing uh, in time. So behind the edibles, we're seeing extracts and concentrates, and then tinctures and topicals round out that list. Tinctures and topicals combined for about 4% of total market share. So uh, smaller, but still, still a player in the game. So uh, total market share, including the illicit market, uh, last year was 88.5 billion. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the fact that there is an illicit market and it's a rather healthy uh, market. So 66 billion on the illicit side. A lot of that can be attributed just from the, the dynamics of this country and the federal legalization or lack thereof and where um, uh, consumers for the longest time have had to access uh, the product until uh, we've seen that shift that we just discussed. Now, for comparison purposes, to look at other consumer spending, uh, soft drinks on an annual basis, 146 billion. Beer, and that's not including craft beer, is 119 billion. Tobacco is 99 billion, and coffee is 82 billion. So, when you look at the total market share, including illicit um, sales, cannabis is a pretty pretty healthy market, and I think it's going to give. Uh, at least beer run for its money um, in, in that respect. What's interesting to note as well on market growth is um, a study that came out uh, evaluating the prices and the fluctuation have shown that in Colorado, Washington, California, and Nevada, uh, all four of those states have seen a price per milligram uh, drop uh, on consumables, so that would be edibles, uh, tinctures, and topicals. And so while we're seeing sales increase, we are seeing 
more competition in the market, which is driving prices down. Now with this growth, we're gonna see uh, millions of new consumers come to, to the market, get thousands of new jobs created, lots of new products and concepts being explored, researched, and developed. And that's going to usher the next generation of, of cannabis uh, into to the marketplace. So now that you've got a pretty good overview of where the market's at and the trajectory of growth, I want to now start to discuss the opportunities and exposures that the industry uh, has. And so um, I, I like to preface this with the, the industry has a lot of talented professionals uh, coming forth, a lot of great businesses and great concepts being developed, but there's obviously a lot of opportunity for improvement. And so uh, this is by no means a slight on the industry. It's just a recognizing the opportunity for improvement, and this is across the board. So um, this is an area that we like to look at and say, how can we make this better for uh, both uh, the the industry as well as consumers and so we'll start that off by, by talking about regulatory environment and I'd be remiss if I didn't start start that conversation off by touching on banking. Now banking is obviously one of the biggest opportunities to reduce unnecessary safety risk in terms of the amount of cash management that we see uh, with the lack of traditional banking channels to the industry. Um, we anticipate that's going to change, but it is definitely a, a big uh, point of discussion. And I think with banking reform, you'll also see greater uh, equitable access to opportunities with the industry. Um, it's right now, it's difficult. You have to find private financing. Terms are not always uh, you know, the best. And so uh, those changes, I think, will, will be a really positive um, change for the industry. Compliance is, um, I think, one of the biggest opportunities here um, in terms of addressing some of the shortcomings from a regulatory standpoint, and um, it, it is a challenge. So when, when it comes to compliance, each state has its own laws, and, and those can change even within the municipalities within a given state. And we are talking, uh, sometimes it's the list of qualifying conditions, maybe it's the allowed products that you have, sampling and testing requirements, uh, types of extraction methods you're allowed to use, cannabinoid, content limitations, and then investment limitations. Some states don't allow for out-of-state investments. Um, and so that makes it challenging for operators within that space to stay competitive with other markets in terms of growth and being able to advance their internal processes and product development. Within states, we're also seeing laws are changing. Now, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later when we talk about the, the trends and uh, things that are working towards addressing these concerns, but it's a slippery slope staying compliant in the industry because laws are constantly evolving and changing. Sometimes these are small changes, sometimes they're much bigger, and it takes a compliance team to stay on top of those. And if you're a multi-state operator, you've got to balance both the, the changes of state regulations um, within each market, as well as uh, how those that's going to impact your processes and, and your standard operating procedures from one market to another. So there are you know some definite challenges in that regard. Uh, in addition, not all regulations are found in the state cannabis regs. And what I mean by that is there are other agencies with oversight. So if an operator comes in and is looking purely at the list of state regulations, it makes it extremely um, you're vulnerable to perhaps missing a zoning requirement or a fire and safety requirement that's specific to a municipality um, that is not listed in the state regs. And then you also have some uh, federal oversight from OSHA or EPA in, in some of the requirements in that regard. On top of that, um, there's a variability in the enforcement. So more licenses a state issues, the more resources they need at hand to enforce those. And uh, as we've seen, not all states take the same approach to licensing and enforcement. Most, if not all states, have state tracking systems to track the plants 
uh, from seed to sale. And so using RFID identification tags, um, there is uh, a management of, of tracking from start to finish all the way to the consumer. That's a, a good system for making sure that everything is accounted for within the, the operation. However, these state tracking systems all, aren't always equipped to handle compliance matters. And so they will allow operators to, uh, to fall out of compliance. And, and that's a, a, an opportunity there to address those shortcomings within those systems. In addition to regulations, there's a lot of variability in the industry. There's variability in the agricultural products that are produced. Um, these are sensitive uh, plants and it's a certain regard and so any fluctuations in environmental conditions can impact the quality of product and the saleability of the products. Um, and you're going to see as well variability in the raw materials and this is one area that I like to, to identify and share with those that are not familiar with the industry. In traditional manufacturing, you have typically a set uh, standard and consistency with products that are or, or raw materials that are being used to make a finished product. In cannabis, there is a variability in the raw materials you're using, and that's in the form of the concentrate. And so there is some inconsistencies from one batch to another. Sometimes they're minor, sometimes they are uh, greater in scope. Uh, that could be cannabinoid content, it could be terpene profile, or other phytochemical constituents of that concentrate. Uh, that can impact flavor, it can impact uh, consistency of the product. And so in traditional manufacturing, you're going to have master batch records, and that's your, uh, your beacon for creating a product. In cannabis, uh, in some products, you're going to need more than one master batch record but that's going to give you a range of uh, recipe formulations to meet the fluctuation in that raw material. And so there's variability there and understanding how to manage that, uh, that variability in your manufacturing process is extremely important for providing uh, consistent quality products to the consumers. You're also going to have variability in processes and equipment. And it's very important that operators understand that just because a manufacturer touts their equipment to perform at a certain spec, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to meet that spec time and time again. So maintenance and operational qualifications and validation play into the variability that we see from uh, equipment performance. And that kind of ties, uh, ties into quality um, assurance and quality management. GMPs, SOPs, and quality are common buzzwords in the industry, and it's great to hear people talking about them. If you Google any cannabis company, there's a pretty good chance you'll see quality mentioned somewhere on their website, and, uh, and that's great. But when you start to, to dive into it a little bit deeper, you see there's, there's quality is broadly referenced, but man, the quality management principles are a little bit more narrowly applied. So there's a lot of opportunity for improvement here. Uh, with GMP and SOPs that, that support GMP, GMP is really built on a quality management framework. And so um, when I talk to, to clients and, and we're talking about quality management, I often uh, get the response where well, we have SOPs and that's great and, and that's important to have but how are you managing those SOPs are they performing and delivering on the intended purpose and uh, function that you have designed them for and uh, and what else are you doing to track and understand that so um, quality assurance quality management goes beyond state mandated testing and that's another response we will get uh, oftentimes as well we do the state mandated testing and that's uh, that's obviously a very important aspect of quality and safety in terms of product and consistency for the end consumer, but there's more that goes into quality management on the front end that can, uh, can safeguard uh, both the company and, and the public health and safety. And kind of rounding out the list of exposures in the industry, uh, high turnover is a big one. And so if you're um, not too familiar with the industry, high turnover is, is something that the industry is notorious for, in some cases as high as 40, 45 percent. 
And so I think this is a shared responsibility uh, between employees and employers, and, and they both contribute to this, uh, this issue. I think um, from an employee's perspective, there may be some disconnect in, between perception and reality of what it is to, to work in the industry. Maybe there's this glamorous perception that it's gonna be uh, a really easy job, you're gonna, you're gonna smoke weed and just sell you know, to consumers, but it's really far from the truth. It's a, it's a very professional industry and people are taking this very serious. They understand that uh, this is an opportunity of a lifetime and we wanna, we wanna take that responsibility uh, very seriously. And so when you get into it, you realize it's challenging work. Um, sometimes the processes are monotonous, uh, repetitive processes that aren't that exciting. And uh, the money, while everybody talks about how much money it's generating, there's a lot that goes into these businesses, a lot of taxes, a lot of, of uh, expenses in supporting uh, the testing, the compliance teams. And so you're not just going to walk in and become a millionaire overnight. And so I think there's some perception uh, and reality that uh, disconnect that, that, that exists there. From an employer's perspective, um, we've seen a lack of talent development on, in some, some cases. And we also have seen uh, time and time again where talented professionals are brought in to, uh, to join a team, but really the intent was just to have them there in a short term. And so uh, they fulfill their obligations and they're let go. And that's also um, uh, contributing to the problem. Either way, this has a direct impact on the quality and compliance. And what we see is a knowledge transfer gap. When, when employees leave, information is not passed along, it's not documented. And so you see um, these, these problems contributing to a company's risk profile. And so that's a, a general overview of some of the major uh, exposures that I see in the industry. By no means is this an exhaustive list. Um, there are definitely other exposures, but, but in the general context and, and I think perspective of the audience uh, today, um, these are, are some of the bigger issues that, that I see. And so going to look at the trends in the industry that are helping address those uh, those concerns, those exposures, and so um, you know one of the one of the top top things that I'm looking at that I'm excited about is the uh, the talent development and education programs that we're seeing come about. And knowledge is key to the growth and maturity of the industry, and and we're seeing this in a couple facets. We um, you know, over the past couple of years, starting to see some, some bigger name universities and colleges recognize the need and the value for this type of curriculum. And obviously with the economic value and size to the industry, uh, these programs are being brought. And so you have industry professionals collaborating with these universities and colleges to develop the programs. And then you're also seeing platforms uh, for professional development, so giving people uh, in the industry an opportunity to expand their body of knowledge and their experience uh, across departmental training, uh, which is great. And so it, it promotes creativity and progression within the industry and also professional growth. And so uh, that's one that, that I personally am excited about in, in engaging in to, to grow and mature the industry from that perspective. We're seeing an advancement in technologies, and this is across the board. So you have software advancements, and, and those are uh, applicable to both uh, regulatory, um, uh, you know, in tracking and enforcement. You're seeing that software being applied to um, uh, enterprise planning and management, um, customer retention management. And, um, and equipment and software is tied pretty much most equipment that you're seeing in the space today has some sort of, of computer interface. And what that uh, is affording is greater insight and transparency into the uh, performance of the equipment and the processes and allowing operators to identify potential deviations within the process that can be addressed before they become larger problems. And so uh, controls 
um, with you know tied into equipment, uh, whether it's uh, lighting and environmental controls or your manufacturing and processing controls, it's great to have that uh, real-time uh, adjustment and flexibility in, in managing those uh, environments and processes. And it's important, as I touched on earlier, uh, with small fluctuations in your cultivation environments, you can uh, you, you can you can experience some major problems. So having real time uh, insight and in, in making those adjustments can go a long way to uh, ensuring product quality and consistency. We're also seeing the equipment uh, evolve. Um, when I got involved in the industry, there were very few equipment manufacturers servicing the industry specifically. So you would have to go out and find manufacturing equipment that was used in parallel industries to serve your needs. And oftentimes that equipment was oversized and really not effective at handling the product that we were working with. And so um, the equipment would either malfunction or it would sit idle a lot of the time. And so you have had over the last several years, more and more equipment manufacturers recognize that operations within cannabis are really servicing, servicing a smaller population. And so the equipment should be um, kind of uh, redesigned and retooled to fit that smaller footprint. And so we're seeing uh, that response. On the cultivation side, um, a lot of advancements in lights and vertical grow infrastructure has come a long way. Uh, you know, when I got started, it was uh, pretty much high intensity discharge or, or high pressure sodium lighting uh, or the go-to lights. They're still being employed in the industry. However, they are extremely energy intensive and uh, and there is some upkeep on those. So we are seeing a, a shift towards LEDs and, and a, a wide acceptance of LED lights. Both energy consumption is much lower. The cost to, to um, uh, run those over time is lower, but there are also a lot of research going into the benefits of the, the various light spectrums that are afforded from LED lighting. Uh, so that's really exciting to see. Extraction and processing equipment has also um, been revamped quite a bit over the last few years. A lot of processes that were independent have now been streamlined and combined within single extraction processing equipment. So what might have taken several days to, to run a product from start to finish is now done in a single day uh, with one piece of equipment. So that's pretty uh, pretty exciting to see that evolution of equipment and technology being applied in this space. Research and development is another area that uh, has got a lot of attention. In, in recent weeks, we've seen the DEA begin issuing research licenses after years of no activity, so that's promising. And there's uh, several channels that are are taking up, um, you know, the the research space. So you have clinical, which is uh, really pharmacological in nature, looking at bioavailability, delivery systems, and the interaction of these products with the endocannabinoid system, which is within uh, everybody's body. You also have research from academia, and that's a little bit more focused towards uh, industry and the so sociology, so sociology and uh, sociological impact. Uh, and acceptance across the board there. So um, some interesting research happening there, and that's that's also, I think, uh, uh, gonna play into uh, benchmarking and best practices uh, as the industry matures, more information is coming to light, and so uh, improving the uh, efficiency and performance of uh, manufacturing and cultivation. And then on the business side, you have uh, operators looking to refine processes, improve upon, grow methodologies, and uh, last but definitely not least, product development. And as I touched on with the recent uh, surgeons in beverage manufacturing, I think we're gonna continue to see uh, more and more creative concepts come to market, unique delivery systems, uh, flavor combinations. I think we're gonna see a shift uh, also to you know, highlight the importance of terpenes, which are one of the uh, constituents, phytochemicals within the plant that impact flavor, but there's also a tremendous amount of therapeutic benefit coming from um, those compounds. So um, that's on the research front. And then 
we are going to see a revision and an update in regulations, We've seen that in some states where they recognize there are some deficiencies in terms of the um, uh, quality management elements within the manufacturing framework, uh, complaint handling, capital and recall plans. So we're seeing states roll these out. They're already a GMP requirement or regulation. And so in time, um, more and more states are starting to adopt these principles. And I think uh, uh, we will see um, uh, in, in our lifetime, I, I would imagine, uh, rather sooner than later, federal legalization that uh, will actually bring that to the forefront very quickly. And so um, I think it's, it's an opportunity for uh, operators as well as regulators to say, look, this makes sense. They're, they're here for a reason. This obviously contributes, contributes to quality consistency, safety, and compliance. So let's put these in place and, uh, and help operators reduce the risk that they have um, in, in managing their operations. We're also seeing some, uh, some updates in terms of additives and restrictions on the use of synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, seen or read something uh, in the news lately around Delta 8 and Delta 10. Uh, many states taking the initiative and, uh, and banning those substances uh, from being sold or manufactured in their states. Uh, it's uh, an interesting uh, dialogue that's happening in the space, but those are additional um, regulations that we're seeing hit the market. And so, um, and then finally wrapping up the, the trends that we're seeing, standards and certifications. And uh, this is uh, one that I'm, I'm particularly uh, interested in, uh, and I think there's a lot of benefits for the industry. Um, there are several entities that are working on leading the way, organizations leading the way here, uh, ASTM International, uh, International Cannabis and Hemp Standards, the Underwriters Laboratory, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Association of Analytical Chemists International, and American National Standards Institute. I know means is this an exhaustive list, but they or some of the uh, early adopters have come in and said, this industry is obviously, um, there's some life here and we should uh, support the industry and let's create some standards. Um, you know, ASTM has created a D737 committee on cannabis. There's eight subcommittees within that uh, organization focusing on everything from indoor and outdoor horticulture and agricultural practices, quality management systems, uh, laboratory practices, processing and handling, uh, security and transportation, personal training, assessment, credentialing, industrial hemp, and rounding that out is cannabis devices and appliances, or uh, yeah, appliances, sorry. So standards uh, are, are beneficial for many reasons. Uh, they're, they're laying the, the framework for which operators uh, should be adhering to uh, safety, quality, and consistency measures, and, and ultimately it will deliver on performance, which is great, and the industry, I think, needs that. I think, uh, you know, there is an opportunity here to help the industry understand that, that it's not necessarily saying you have to standardize and, and duplicate what everybody else is doing. I think there's still a lot of flexibility within the space to have unique processes and unique products, but the underlying principles of how to do that and effectively manage the elements of quality and safety are at the basis of standards and certification process. And so we're starting to see also an increase in certification uh, boards, accredited boards, uh, nonprofits coming to, to the table and saying, let's help the industry establish, um, you know, a, a qualification um, metric so that companies can go out and demonstrate their ability to to meet these standards to the greater public as well as to uh, potential business partners or clients. So that is uh, in in uh, in conclusion here. That's those are some of the trends that we're seeing. Now there's. Uh, I think a lot of benefits to these trends and, and what we're seeing is, you know, a, um, a movement towards addressing quality management and quality assurance. So these, these trends are helping uh, establish benchmarking um, for the industry. And, and so, you know, another big buzzword that we hear within this space 
it says best practices. Everybody's got best practices, but when you look at it, much like quality management, there's a lot that goes into that. And how are you really um, stepping up and uh, establishing that this is truly a best practice? And this is where benchmarking comes in and the quality management principles come in to actually lay the framework, which is laid out in standards and help people understand this is how you, you track, you measure, and you gauge whether or not you have a be best practice and when uh, in this process or uh, the process design stage you need to make uh, improvements or adjustments to the processes. And so it's really, um, I think it's going to be a, a, a big improvement opportunity for the industry uh, with these trends to address quality management on, on a larger scale. It's helping to address safety concerns. I touched on uh, corrective action, preventive action plans. And so safety is, is top of mind. And I think that should be top of mind for any operator in this space is making sure that the products have been tested uh, so they are safe for consumers uh, in, in public health safety. Then there's the research side that's contributing uh, to proving out the efficacy of products. Um, there are many touted health benefits of the plant, and 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 rightfully so. Uh, but the clinical research uh, that's being done is helping to validate those claims, which I think is is very important uh, for the the long term success of the industry is to have uh, information and data to back up those claims. Uh, productivity and performance, again, touching on best practices and also seeing uh, an improvement and in, in shift towards more automation. Even with smaller footprints, that shift is increasing the performance levels and the efficiency, reducing downtimes and reducing defects within the manufacturing process. So um, establishing the standards, having your protocols, having your, your documentation and being able to track that and respond to it. Uh, is definitely contributing to you know, an improvement in productivity and efficiency. And a uh, subject that most of you uh, listening today are probably well familiar with, risk management. Risk management, I think, touches every aspect of the industry, and these standards are helping companies identify and address uh, exposure uh, within their operations and manage risk, uh, or at least get a better understanding um, transparency into the risk that exists and how to respond and handle that risk to the best of their ability. Uh, so these are these are all the benefits that I see in terms of the standards and trends that we discussed earlier. And as we look forward as to what's coming down the pipe, I think, you know, federal legalization, banking reform, a lot of discussion around that. I think banking reform is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and, and I do anticipate us seeing federal legalization happen at some point over the next decade. Um, we are seeing a shift uh, as well for social equity programs. Uh, we're recently, I've seen Colorado and Washington come to the plate, uh, establish their own social equity programs, which were missing originally. A lot of the new emerging states definitely baking those into the programs. I think they're extremely valuable and important um, for for our community at large, uh, but also just a long-term success um, and, and access uh, to, to the industry. And we're also gonna see a lot more research and development from the health and wellness aspects of minor cannabinoids and terpene uh, ratios and concentrations and, and mixtures therein. Sustainable initiatives are another hot topic. Um, the cannabis injury, industry is extremely, extremely um, um, intensive in terms of the carbon footprint it takes to to cultivate um, the products. And so uh, starting to see more and more attention, research and development processes, equipment that are addressing those concerns. Um, you know, we're starting to see more renewable packaging, even hemp uh, sourced um, uh, sustainable packaging and so I think that's a, another area we'll see a lot of opportunities start to emerge and um, and with you know the younger generation really putting an emphasis on company ethos I think companies that are taking sustainable initiatives and really um, owning those and they're going to see um, a return and, and obviously it is uh, you know, a hot topic in uh, in general today 
uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, it's, it's still a relatively new uh, industry that is emerging. I, I see a lot of opportunities uh, with that, both from a, an equipment advancement and, and refinement of uh, sensors and tracking uh, environmental conditions within grows to tracking plant health, disease, and pest uh, outbreaks. Um, but I also see uh, there being a lot of opportunities on the regulation side of things where um, agencies using more software and technology to aid in the enforcement and uh, in, in response to the industry needs and consumer needs for protecting public health and safety, but also uh, giving the opportunity to uh, utilize less human resources to, to still do the same job. So I see that as a, a shift um, uh, coming down the pipe as well. And then as, uh, as, as everybody on this call has probably seen in, in the last couple of months, cybersecurity is making headlines uh, with some, some major companies um, feeling um, you know, the, the effects of cyber attacks. And I think the cannabis industry is, is prime for, um, you know, companies coming in and, and helping the industry address those, um, those exposures before they become a problem. Um, this is something too, I think, um, we touched on earlier, the illicit market, you've got um, an illicit market where um, you know, the players there, the legal industry is impacting um, their revenue streams. And so they are crafty, um, you know, entities that that will do anything to protect their revenue streams and so i think cybersecurity is is one that uh, should not be overlooked and with that that concludes um the the presentation on cannabis today and where it's going and the opportunities at hand with that i'll hand it back over to andy for questions thank you sean uh fantastic topic there fantastic content i did want to note to the audience that uh, you, you, some have already been doing this, but uh, just to make sure you know, the GoToWebinar platform allows us to ask questions, to post questions through the chat feature. So please do take uh, an opportunity while we have Sean here to ask any questions you may wish. One question that came in early, I should have predicted this one, is uh, that uh, will we be posting this presentation? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we do intend to do so. Uh, we will be putting it on the ISO Emerging Issues website, which is found at emergingissues.iso.com. Just to put, a, put it out there, you do need an ISO net login to access that content, but we do intend to put it up there. Um, another question that came in concerned bioengineering and asking if perhaps, Sean, if you think that bioengineering um, in lieu of today's more conventional farming and cultivation might be a viable way to address some of the variability issues that you spoke about earlier in terms of growing. And I can tell you, I know our emerging issues team has been tracking and looking at even things like bioengineered um, brewer's yeast, which apparently can be used to create CBD and THC according to those um, that are advertising and say they can do it in a week. So I don't know if that was on your radar, but maybe you could just speak to in general, at least about how bio, bioengineering can maybe help us tackle some of these uh, quality challenges. Definitely, it is on my radar. I think it is a, a channel that's going to, to get greater attention as, as we look at the carbon footprint that the industry has. But more importantly, as uh, the question uh, touches on the variability issues, uh, not only within growing, but manufacturing. And if we can, uh, find the means to creating a very consistent, uh, for the most part, pure uh, raw materials to help develop these products. There's definitely a lot of viability in that. Um, you know, I touched on terpenes and terpenes, you can source isolated terpenes. And so, you know, there, there's the ability to take these components and kind of reconstruct the, um, uh, I guess, the, the, DNA of the plant to a certain extent in products, and, and that's the attempt. But I definitely see bioengineering playing a role in this uh, in this industry. Uh, to what extent, still kind of unsure about it. But have seen the articles and read about the uh, the yeast uh, opportunity. I think that was uh, developed by a university in, in or a group of uh, researchers in uh, California, and that that definitely caught my attention because of the opportunity there. And we have been seeing some. 
uh, you know, initiatives in bioengineering um, come to light with how they're manipulating uh, some of the, um, the genetics to address bioavailability and, um, and some of the uh, other physical traits of the plant to make it more workable from a manufacturing standpoint or uh, make it more resistant to uh, certain issues that are, are common in, in horticulture. Thanks, John. Yeah, the, it, it seems like it's really gone from the uh, the basement to the to the laboratory and to the college campus. Uh, you know, in terms of the study and and the possibilities, there was something you had mentioned earlier too that I, I wanted to just reflect on and maybe expand on a bit. You talked about the banking banking reform, and I think uh, at least in federal terms, that's referred to as the safe as the safe act. Uh, I did want to also mention just because we have a lot of insurance professionals on the phone, that there's also a claim act, uh, I believe that was reintroduced back in March of this year. If it goes before the Senate floor, it's reported to create a safe harbor uh, for insurers that are engaging in the business of, you know, cannabis related legitimate businesses. So um, that might be very much of interest to those on the phone. The ISO Emerging Issues team is going to continue to track that those legislative efforts and report on that. But I did want to note that that Claim Act, if you don't know about it, you know, Google it, take a look. Um, that could definitely change the landscape quite a bit. Yeah, I, I'll expand on that just a little bit, Andy. The um, the experience that we've had uh, from a banking perspective is is uh, is unique. There have been some banks that have come to the table and said, "We'll bank you." Um, and, and we'll charge you 3% of all your deposits um, and, you know, a $5,000 monthly fee. It's, it's, it's uh, quite expensive. We, we found a bank um, in Colorado that, that was willing to bank us without those fees. But the, uh, the due diligence that they took and the processes that we were required to adhere to to bank um, it really it caught my attention because they recognized the concerns around banking the industry and so they set out to to address those concerns and what happened is we would have to give you know a full um we would have to re basically send in our uh, entire books uh every month so they could review every transaction make sure everything was accounted for uh, with our receipts uh, for for any transactions, we had quarterly site visits, and then went on an annual basis. We had a third party um, independent inspection for compliance purposes to make sure everything was on the up and up. And um, at first, you think, okay, that that's just a lot to be asking of operators. But in time, you become very conditioned to that, and you know that's expected. And so, once you get past that that initial shock of how much is required you're able to build those uh, those systems into um you know to your normal operations and i see you know a lot of the topics that we talked about today being something that it wouldn't surprise me if insurance companies say hey if we want to write policies for the industry we should probably put some requirements in here that they have some of these uh, you know uh, quality management systems or components they're in so we know They've at least addressed that and are managing uh, to the best of their ability some of these elements that would increase risk uh, for operators and stakeholders. Thanks, Sean. We uh, we've got another one coming in. If we can just continue to throw that throw it sure. at you uh, while we have time here, uh, any improvements in the consistency of labeling requirements? And maybe I'll just add on to that and, and note that we've seen. This might be more asking about the constituents of the product, but we've also seen restrictions in terms of, you know, no imagery that might be attractive to children. I think some states don't even allow you to put color on the labels. So maybe you could just speak in general about if we're seeing some improvements uh, in the consistency in that realm. Uh, sure. So um, I, I guess this is a, a somewhat uh, dynamic question is um, when we look at consistency of labeling requirements, um, you, you touch on, I think, the, the marketing aspect of labels and what a state may or may not allow. Um, the intent there, keeping this um, package uh, or reducing the attractiveness of these packages and the contents within uh, to children. We wanna obviously protect and safeguard um, children from getting access to these products and protecting that. So 
Um, in terms of consistency, um, we do we do see a, a wide variety of rules, and some states have stricter rules than others. Um, you know, I think most states out there have um, limitations on uh, the use of cartoon cartoon characters, animals, um, you know, fruit shapes, anything that would be appealing to a kid. Uh, and, and mislead them into thinking it's a, a product safe for their consumption. We do see each state coming out with their own um, coined universal um, identification symbol uh, to notify anybody who is purchasing or, or comes across that package that there's cannabis within that package. However, uh, kids aren't always uh, savvy to the fact that that's that's indicating that. So there's the marketing aspect of it. Then there's the consistency in terms of uh, product labeling, uh, ingredients that are going into it, and then the testing um, requirements. And so uh, most, if not all, states have a requirement that the the THC content be listed on the package, and and they specify the format. Uh, those are slight, they can be slightly different um, font size slightly different from state to state. Uh, some states require terpene profiles to also be listed on the labeling requirements. Um, and so you, there is inconsistency from state to state of what's required. Um, there's also um, I think from a quality perspective right now the I think the only context that individuals going into purchase from a dispensary have in terms of quality is a THC concentration number on a label and that can be rather misleading uh, just because a product is lower in THC concentration doesn't necessarily mean it won't have um, a uh, a more intense high and that's where terpenes play into it and so that can be a little misleading and there's obviously a lot of, of education uh, that needs to happen around you know what contributes to the overall effects of a product so we are seeing um, there's still a lot of variety in terms of, of labeling requirements that's something that uh, I think through federal legalization we become streamlined and consistent so that uh, the language um, you know, there's uh, for, the, for the most part, those warning statements are are fairly consistent, but there's small nuances, and sometimes it's just uh, one word. But from a compliance perspective, if you don't change that word, you're out of compliance, and and that mm -hmm. creates you know some some unnecessary um, risk. So, unfortunately. Still a lot of inconsistency in the labeling part. Imagine how it might be confusing to consumers, and particularly that that last point that you mentioned that even seeing, you know, the THC expressed uh, may not be fully indicative of the experience that the user may have. So uh, hopefully that can be that can become more standardized and more understandable. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question that came in, Sean, I'm, I'm going to let you get a sip of water here. Maybe I can jump on this one. We were asked what ISO is doing specifically to address uh, cannabis industry in terms of our forms. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, but at a very high level, I can tell you that we have uh, filed um, and in some lines of business. Um, many of these filings have been approved. Uh, a number of exclusionary endorsements um, in different flavors from, quote unquote, a total exclusion to exclusions with uh, lessor risk exemptions and hemp exemptions uh, across a number of our commercial lines. Uh, I would encourage anyone, and at the end I'll mention my contact info, reach out to me. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I can tell you more about the solutions we put out there, not only in terms of those exclusions that I meant, but I mentioned, but also in terms of some coverage options that are going to be coming out later this year, we hope. So, um, there's definitely a lot of activity within Veris, within ISO, on cannabis and, and more to come. And again, um, you can reach out to me and I'd be happy to share. Um, I guess that probably, we're with five minutes to the top of the hour, we should probably get to wrapping it up. Um, Sean, if there are any other uh, unanswered questions here, if it's okay, I'll toss them your way. Sure. And you can answer you know, at, at your leisure. Up on the screen before everyone is Sean's contact info. Uh, I encourage you also that you can reach out to him directly as you as you've just heard for the last hour. He's clearly an expert. 
he knows all about this this topic and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to engage. And as mentioned, here's my contact info. So if you had more questions about what, what ISO is doing in this space, what the Emerging Issues team is doing, please do reach out. We wanna keep the conversation going. Um, I do also want a quick sec, take just a quick second uh, to pay attention to the man behind the curtain, uh, Vince Conti, thank him for putting this presentation together. And especially Sean, we really enjoyed having you here today. Uh, great stuff and you know, what a dynamic issue to track and try to keep it top of, and it's a challenge for all of us, but you, I think you really helped us educate us. So we do thank you and we thank everyone on the line for their valuable time. We hope we earned your, your attention. We hope you'll join us again. Until then, everyone, please stay well and be safe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean.